Welcome to Hot Chips 26. Session 7. Dense Servers and Server Technology. I think we'll get going. Um, welcome. Good to see you back this afternoon. Uh, I'm Forrest Basket. I'm chair of your session on dense servers and server technology. Um, <clears throat> our first speaker will be Owen Chen uh, from MIT, who will speak on Scorpio, a 36 core shared memory processor with a coherent mesh. Uh, Owen is a PhD student at MIT, uh, working with Professor Li Xuan Pen. His interests include computer architecture and on-chip networks, um, and he is looking to graduate next spring, and is also looking for a job. Um, please welcome Owen. Uh, hi, everyone. Thanks for the introduction. Um, today, I would like to share with you uh, on a research prototype that we built at MIT with support from Freescale. Uh, Scopio uh, is an acronym of SUBI Coherence Research Prototype uh, with interconnect ordering. Uh, Scopio is a general purpose multiprocessor with 36 cores or 36 tiles. Um, the, chip is, uh, the chip is the um, 11 millimeter by 30 millimeter in size and has around 600 million transistors. Uh, it is implemented in 45 nanometer SOI technology. The number of cores uh, on this chip is simply is chosen simply based on the area budget that we have that we had at that time. Uh, Scopio supports unified shared memory and uses a Snoopy coherence to maintain the cache coherency. All 36 tiles are interconnected using a 2D mesh network uh, that supports the Snoopy coherence. The chip also has two memory controllers on two sides of the chip that talk to um, the off-chip memory. So Snoopy coherence is implemented generally um, with older interconnects such as buses or rings. Uh, however, these interconnects, these older interconnects, do not scale with, well with high core count, which uh, degrade the system overall performance. Other topologies, such as mesh network, provide better performance scaling, but they are unordered in nature, which makes them um, unusable for Snoopy coherence. So in this presentation, I'll I will tell you how we enable the Snoopy coherence on a meshing interconnect. I do want to add that our technique is not limited only to mesh network um, and can be applied to other topologies as well. First, let's take a look at the tile architecture. Um, all 36 tiles are homogeneous, and each tile consists of a core and a two-level cache hierarchy. We use the E200 uh, core from Freescale. Uh, the core is dual issue and in order. Both L1 and L2 caches are private to the core, and we have a network uh, that connects uh, the L2 co cache controllers and the memory controllers. To maintain the cache coherency, uh, we configure the L1 cache to perform write through to L2 and we configure the L2 cache to back invalidate the L1 on receiving validation messages from other L2 caches. We adopted a modified uh, MOSI Snoopy coherence protocol from James Simulator. Um, we added several optimizations to uh, improve the performance. First of all, we added an additional old dirty state to reduce the write-back frequency. Write-backs 
writebacks cause subsequent requests to the same line to go off chip to retrieve the data, and it will increase the latency. With the old dirty state, we allow on-chip sharing of the dirty data so that we can um, retain the data on the chip for as long as possible. Secondly, we disallow the blocking of incoming snoop requests. When the cache line is in a transient state due to a pending write request, um, the subsequent, uh, subsequent snoop requests to the same line will be stored um, and wait until the data is received and the write request, uh, write request is completed. This also blocks the subsequent other snoop requests even if they can be processed right away. To solve this problem, uh, we use the data forwarding list that tracks the core IDs of the subsequent request uh, that match the uh, pending write request. With this information, we can ensure that uh, no uh, snoop request will be stored, and on receiving the data response, the core will forward the, um, the updated cache line to a to the course track on the list. And finally, because not all the cores will share the same, um, same cache lines all the time, we use a destination filtering scheme to filter out redundant snoop requests to reduce the load on the L2 cache controllers. We use, a, as mentioned earlier, we use a 6 by 6, six mesh interconnect to um, connect the L2 controllers and the memory controllers. The data path of the mesh network is 137 bit wide, and we have one router per tile. This figure shows the microarchitecture of, uh, of the router. The router has three stage pipelines. To avoid uh, protocol level deadlock, uh, we use two virtual networks, one for the requests and one for the responses. And we also use the dimensional extra routing scheme to avoid the network level deadlock. To improve the network performance, we apply several optimizations. Within each virtual network, we use multiple virtual channels to reduce the effect of half of line blocking. We also equipped the router with broadcast support so that um, the router can, so that the router can uh, fork a message to multiple directions. This reduces the number of messages required to inject it into the network. To lower the network latency, we allow bypassing um, some router pipelines with the use of lookaheads. A lookahead uh, contains some routing information and is sent to the next router one cycle ahead before we send the actual message. At the next router, the lookahead will join the arbitration to, um, to get the access to, uh, to the crossbar. If it wins the arbitration, the message that comes one cycle later can traverse the crossbar immediately and skip the first two pipeline stages. This optimization, uh, this optimization reduces the number of cycles required to traverse the router from three to one. OK, so the key contribution of this work is how to support Snoopy coherence on, uh, on an on older network. The problem is that on an unordered on network, different nodes may receive the broadcast messages in different order. For example, as shown in the figure here, tile 0 and tile 1 see uh, request 2 followed by request 1. And uh, tile 35 see request 1 followed by request 2. However, for the Snoopy coherence, what we want is that all the nodes see all messages in the same global order. To achieve this, our solution is to decouple the message delivery from the message ordering. We start with, uh, we start with 
the high-performance mesh network that I described earlier, um, we call it the MAN network. The MAN network is responsible for delivering uh, coherence requests and response messages. And note that uh, this network will, uh, will deliver these messages in any order. To handle the ordering of the messages, we use an additional network called notification network. So how does the notification work? When the core injects a message into the network, it, uses the not it also uses the notification network to notify all other cores that this request um, needs to be ordered. Based on the notifications received, each core can take a decision on the order of, of the corresponding uh, main network messages. So if we can ensure that all the cores can make the decision, then we can ensure the global ordering of the, uh, of the actual messages. Um, so the notification network um, is simply, is essentially a network with multiple parallel uh, broadcast trees. Each tile has its own dedicated one-bit broadcast tree um, from its from the core and spend out to all other cores. The broadcast tree is pipelined with a, a flip-flop at each tile. So we can, so there is a maximum bounded delay of this kind of broadcast tree to, prog uh, to propagate a value from the tree root to all the leaves. The design of the notification network is very simple and low cost. If we define, um, if we uh, if, if if we design the custom design a broadcast tree for each tile, then we only need a bunch of flip flops. In our implementation, to ease the place and route effort, we went for a modular design and used a notification router. Uh, as shown here for all the tiles. So in addition to flip-flops, we also need um, some OR gates. But the notification router is still very low cost. How do we use this bounded delay? With this property, we can then define a time window um, that is larger or equal to this bounded delay. In, for our chip, the time window is uh, 12 cycles. And the way we use the time window is that when a core sends, uh, sends a message into a main network, in the beginning of the coming time window, the core will also use the notification to broadcast this information to all other cores. And then at the end of the time window, because of the bounded delay property, all other cores will um, all other cores will know that uh, will know all the messages that need that need to be ordered, and they will have the same information of this. If we use the same arbitration logic for all the cores, then all the cores can make the same decision on the order to process these messages. That is, uh, all the tiles can determine the global order of the messages uh, locally. Let me use a walkthrough example to further explain how, uh, how we ordered, uh, how we broadcast two coherence requests and order them in the same order and, and process them in the same order on a 16-core system. At time t1, Core 11 injects a request into the main network. At time T2, Core 1 injects another request in the, in the, into the main network. And then at time T3, which is the beginning of the coming time window, both Core 1 and Core 11 um, use the notification, uh, notification network 
to broadcast this information. You can see the light green box on the right. Um, core 11 will only assert the bit on bit 11. And core 1 will only assert the bit 1. All the cores may receive uh, the two requests at any time. It can be within the same time window, depending on the distance, and, or the next time window, or even later, depending on the network traffic at that time. And then at the end of the, at time t4, which is the end of the time window, because of the bounded delay property, all cores are ensured to receive the same notification message uh, with bit 1 and bit 11 assert asserted. Then by using the same arbitration algorithm, they can determine the order um, to process, uh, to determine an order uh, to process the requests. In our example, we assume that all cores decide to process the request from core 1, followed by the request from core 11. So at time t5, since core 1, 2, 3, 5, 6, and 9 have received uh, the request from core 1, they can proceed and process the request right away. However, for core 7, 10, 11, 12, and 15, even though they have received the request from core 11, they still need to wait for the request from core 1 before they can proceed. And eventually, all the cores will receive both requests. In any, in, they can be in any order. But they will all pr process the request from core 1, uh, followed by the request from core 11. And after that, it's very obvious. At time t6 and t7, core 6 and core 13 um, send back the, send back the uh, data response and complete the transactions. To support parallel programming and correct program functionalities, we also implement the support for some synchronization primitives. For example, we implement the support for the low link and store conditional instructions. The linked address is tracked at the L2 cache line uh, granularity, and we leverage the coherence protocol to detect modifications to the linked addresses. We also implement the support for um, sync-related instructions and use the ordered broadcast mechanism to ensure that um, all the memory operations are seen by all other cores before the sync is completed. To show the benefit of Scopio, we evaluated the Scopio using a James and Garnet simulator. We compare Scopio with two baselines, limited pointer directory coherence and the AMD hypertransport coherence. We chose these two uh, baselines to isolate the effect of storage overhead and the effect of interaction latency. Hypertransport and Scopio use only one bit per cache line to track whether the owner of the cache line is on chip or not, whereas limited pointer directory uses multiple bits to track a number of shares on a chip. In our evaluation, uh, we allow limited pointer directory to track at most four shares. If there are more than four cores sharing the same cache line, the cache line, um, the cache line to, to that, uh, the requests to that cache line will be broadcast to all other cores. The L, both L, uh, limited pointer directory and hypertransport use directory as the ordering point, which means that all the requests need to be uh, sent to the directory before they can be forwarded to the shares. This introduces interaction latency. Here I show the normalized uh, full system runtime 
for some applications from Parsec and Splash benchmarks. On average, Scopio shows 24% uh, better than limited ported directory and 13% better than hypertransport. To see why uh, Scopio performs better, we further investigated the L2 service latency. We defined the service latency to be from the time that the request is injected into the network to the time that the response is received. If the requests are served by other L2 caches, even though Scopio requires extra time to order the request in the network, due to the avoidance of the request interaction, on average, Scopio has the uh, service latency 19% uh, lower than the baselines. And if the requests are served by the directory, the service latency well, is dominated by the object memory access. On average, Scopio performs better than the limited pointer directory. It is because that limited pointer directory uses more bits per cache line to, in, the, in the directory and experiences higher miss rate than Scopio. And as for hi uh, hypertransport, all the requests, uh, the directory can process the incoming requests immediately without waiting for them to be ordered in the network. So hypertransport performs slightly better than Scopio. In our evaluation, 90% of the requests are uh, are served by other L2 caches, and 10% are served by the directory. So the average L2 uh, service latency for Scopio is 17% lower than limited pointer directory and 14% lower than hypertransport. Next, we see the next, I'll show you the cost of the proposed network design. Here is the area area breakdown of a tile. The L1 and L2 caches are the a major area contributor, occupying around 60% of the tile area. The NIC and the router alone occupies around 10% of the, uh, the tile. And as for power, uh, while core contributes to around 50% of the tile power, the NIC and the router consumes around 20%. The chip has a post layout frequency of 833 megahertz and, cons and has an estimated power consumption of 28.8 watts. Uh, here, here are the key contributions of this work. We designed and implemented Scopio a 36-core shared memory processor that supports uh, scalable Snoopy coherence. We showed that Scopio is 24% and 13% better than the baselines. Our post layout evaluation shows that the chip can run at 833 megahertz with a power consumption of 28.8 watt. Scopio incorporates a novel network on chip to support Snoopy, uh, to support scalable Snoopy coherence. The key idea here is that we decouple the message delivery from the message ordering. With this and the distributed ordering mechanism, we can avoid the bottlenecks of the centralized ordering points and leverage, and leverage the benefit of uh, high performance and scalable on-chain networks. Uh, we have got our chip back, and we also got the board. Uh, we're currently working on the software, develop, software stack. Eventually, we would like to boot Linux on it and run uh, some interesting applications. In parallel, we are also working on the chip measurement to get the actual timing of the chip and the power consumption. Uh, that concludes my talk. Thank you.
have some questions, either side. John? Yeah, John Mashey. Uh, quick question, could you go back to the uh, graph that has the 24% better? I think it was the normalized runtime comparisons. Yeah, that's the one. Uh, just a quick question. So how did mm -hmm. you compute the 24% better? Uh, we compute the, so it is normalized runtime, so the, so you can see that, um, you can see that the green bar is 24. Yeah, yeah. It was, was it the arithmetic mean or the geometric mean? Uh, I believe it is a ge geometric mean. Good. Here. Steven from MediaTek. And talking about the nodes, actually, mm. normally you have the nodes and you, you can bypass your traffic. And sometimes, actually, your CPU is not only the tire, you have the memory or you have the, some PCIe, and uh, also you have multimedia. So mm -hmm. that's not a homogeneous. And uh, you need if you use a dimensional x, y, and mm -hmm. sometimes it's not totally fit in. And also some request actually is the first mode. Some you have a high priority, some is not. And how do you control that? And how big is your queue, queue in, in uh, each node? Okay, thank you. Uh, so I'll first answer the last question on the queuing. Uh, I think, I believe that we have like uh, uh, four to six buffers at the endpoints for each virtual network. And uh, so the, you, you mentioned that the homogeneous can also have like uh, other blocks other than, uh, other than like just this tile. And I'm not completely sure like why, uh, why you said that the dimensional ordering does not suffice. Sometimes actually your block is not just a regular block. You maybe mm -hmm. occupy a few tires. And how do you solve the problem? Okay, so so I, I think the question can be uh, so I mean there are already a lot of data log avoidance for the data log avoidance techniques to solve uh, for the uh, irregular mesh network, and uh, it doesn't really affect the way we do the ordering. How many uh, command queue you have instead of just uh, one data, data bus? You have a 137 bits data bus, and how many command, command uh, bus you have? Like uh, your handshaking, you have a data handshaking and also your address handshaking. Uh, so, it, 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 is a, it is a mesh network and it is pi, uh, pocket. Uh, packet design, uh, packet or uh, I, I mean packetized network. So you you it's it's not like a bus. You have the handshaking um, interface. So you send the message to all the cores, and then um, you send the message to all the cores, and re you receive that. So and then in our implementation, we use one single network to achieve this, and we separate the network uh, with the virtual networks. Over here. I'm Jack Schkepp from NVIDIA. Um, so if I understand the design is that every cache miss, L2 cache miss, goes to all the other L2s as part of a SNU. How do you how, how do you design the system to be able to maintain that much SNU family? Because uh, each so L2 is going to get a, a 30, 36 SNUs per cycle, effectively, for, for uh, uh, sorry, uh Sorry, can you speak out a little bit? I couldn't. Um, yes. How does the, um, uh, if, I assume that in this design, every L2 miss goes to all the other L2s and mm -hmm. you need to snoop it up. How do you maintain that snoop bandwidth in each L2? It seems like a lot of snoop bandwidth that needs to happen. And how does that scale as the system gets bigger? Yes, um, so, in, so uh, in, in our uh, evaluations, we don't see that much requests, but that's because of the applications that we evaluated. And then, so if you want to scale further, like to 100 cores, and definitely 
like simple like simple broadcast will will actually blow blow out the uh, network uh, bandwidth. So one way that we're looking at is to um, to incorporate the in-network filtering scheme to filter out the uh, broadcast messages so that you don't really broadcast the message to all the cores. You filter out the you filter out the messages um, in, in in the middle of the network. Does that answer your question? You use like a snoop filter. Hmm? You use a snoop filter to say that the I know these L2s don't have it, so I don't need to send it. Yeah. To so like on this on this chip, we use a destination filtering. And but if you want to scale to more like higher core counts, you probably want to explore like uh, in-network in filtering so that uh, the the traffic will not just bro broadcast to all other cores. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Our second paper is uh, Next Generation Spark Processor Cache Hierarchy. Uh, the two uh, speakers are uh, Ram Krishnan and um, Sumti uh, Jahrath. Uh, Ram has worked in the area of caches and multiprocessor coherence for 18 years. Um, and <clears throat> He joined Sun in 1966, uh, went to Afara, uh, went back to Sun when Afara was acquired, um, was worked on several microprocessor development teams, starting with the T1 on through to the current generation of M6 T6. Uh, he manages uh, development of cache hierarchy and coherent systems for Oracle Spark processors. As a bachelor's in uh, electronics and communications engineering from the National Institute of Technology in Warangal, India, and a master's in double E from uh, University of um, 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 Las Vegas. Uh, Shumpti is a senior architect at Oracle, worked on Spark processor silicon performance analysis and tuning. His primary focus is on software and silicon exploring software acceleration methods using hardware engines. Uh, Ram? So today, Sumti and I will be talking about the cache hierarchy of the next generation Oracle Spark processor, codenamed M7. Uh, we have another talk in this conference in the Big Iron session where Steve Phillips from Oracle will be talking about the processor as a whole, highlighting several of its key attributes in this talk, we are focused mainly on the cache hierarchy. Um, so this is just an obligatory legal slide. I'll just skip through that. So here's how our presentation is organized. I'll provide an overview of the M7 processor and talk a little bit about the partitioned L3 cache organization. So in this processor, we've taken the set of core clusters, broken them down into, into a set of cores and broken them down into core clusters and we've attached an L3 partition to each core cluster. And the partitions then talk to each other across an on-chip network. This is a deviation from what we've done in the past with the L3, so I'll explain um, why we made this architectural choice and also talk about some of the design objectives that we set out to achieve uh, with this L3 organization. Um, I'll also talk a little bit about uh, the core cluster and uh, the L3 partition and the attributes within uh, within those units. And briefly touch upon the on-chip network that's used for communication between partitions and the coherence protocol that we use for multiprocessor coherence. At that point, um, Sumti will come on stage. He'll talk about the uh, features that we've added to the on-chip protocol that enable us to extract the maximum benefit out of this cache hierarchy. Um, he'll also talk about specific examples of how these features can adapt themselves to workload execution. And finally, we'll uh, conclude our presentation. So uh, the next generation Oracle Spark processor is codenamed M7. M7 contains 32 cores that are organized as eight core clusters. Um, we have 64 megabytes of L3 cache. That's the aggregate L3 capacity and you can see that in the middle of the die photo. We have eight DDR4 schedulers that are capable of sustaining a 
memory bandwidth of 160 gigabytes per second on stream. We have a coherency subsystem that can scale up the processor count from 1 to 32 using a directory-based protocol. Uh, we have a coherency and I.O. interconnect bandwidth of 336 gigabytes per second per socket, and this is per direction. Um, and this bandwidth has been provided for SMP scaling and I.O. transport. But in addition, on this processor, we've added some support in the hardware for cl clustering primitives. So some of this bandwidth is provided for clustering between SMP nodes. And last but not the least, we've added eight data analytics accelerators for accelerating specific query functions. They also perform decompression at memory bandwidth. And uh, we've also provided messaging support in, in those accelerators. So why did we choose a partition last level cache? We have a logically unified cache in our previous generation, and it seems to be serving us well. Um, the thing is, we've scaled up the core count and cache size quite significantly in this processor. And maintaining the logically unified organization would have meant a much longer L3 latency. And that would have started impacting, we saw that it, it would have impacted all uh, response time critical applications. And it would have lost its sheen even for, for large shared workloads. So we decided to look at an alternate organization. Uh, so what we've done is we've taken the set of cores in the processor, which is 32, broken them down into eight core clusters, and provided a local L3 partition for each core cluster. So a core cluster can allocate into that partition and access that partition with very low latency. So just doing that um, benefited a whole bunch of applications which have uh, low or no sharing. In addition, what we did was we said if we can provide a network for very low latency data transfer from uh, one partition to another, uh, we can maybe make this cache look like a large shared cache and derive all the benefits uh, of a large shared cache while not paying the latency penalty. So we decided to take the leap and went with a partition cache. So having made the decision to go with a partition cache, um, the design objectives that we set out to achieve were very straightforward. The first one, the figure of merit that we wanted to really do well on, was the minimization of L2 miss latency. It almost goes without saying. Um, the other things that we wanted to do was we wanted to provide an on-chip network with very low latency between partitions, and also provide some protocol support for bunching together a set of these partitions and making them effectively operate as a larger shared cache. So throughout this presentation, we'll, uh, we'll share how we addressed these objectives. So this is what a core cluster and a partition contains within uh, the M7 processor. Each core cluster has four S4 Spark cores. These are the fourth generation Spark cores with two issue out of order. Uh, each S4 core has a two issue out of order pipeline and it has eight strands. The L1 iCache, is, L1 iCache and dCache are both 16 kilobytes in size. The L1 dCache is right through. And what we've done in this uh, generation of processor is that we've split the L2 cache into an instruction and a data cache. The previous generation had a unified L2. And the splitting had a dual purpose. Uh, we needed to provide the uh, cache bandwidth for throughput critical applications. Uh, so it solved that. And the other thing that it did was uh, there are certain commercial apps, especially OLTP, which have a rather large code footprint. So to increase the IPC of those applications, we provided a, um, a separate instruction L2 cache. So the L2i is 256 kilobytes, an eight-way set associative. It's shared by four cores. Uh, there are two instances of the L2 d cache within each core cluster. Each instance is the same size as the i cache but it's only shared by two cores. And all these L2 caches are dual banked for throughput. Um, a core cluster is connected to an eight megabyte L3 partition um, through a very high bandwidth interface that's nearly 200 gigabytes per second. Again, we wanted to provide the ability for high IPC, high throughput applications to just get the data out of the L3. And the load to use latency of an L3 partition is 41 cycles. This is in, 
uh, core clocks, and it's, that's less than 10 nanoseconds at the frequency at which we plan to run this processor. So that's a significant reduction in core clocks in the L3 hit latency that we've been able to accomplish from the previous generation. So in our previous generation, um, so this reduction is about 25% from what we've um, been able to do for L3 hits on T5 and M6. So here's a diagram that tries to put the whole uh, processor together. It's a block diagram showing an on-chip network that runs right through the middle of the processor. Uh, there are eight ports corresponding to the eight partitions on the on-chip network. And there are four ports corresponding to the four SMP and I.O. gateways. These gateways contain the directory that's used for multiprocessor coherence. And they're also responsible for processing a request that misses in all the eight partitions. And on the left and right of the on-chip network, there are four ports each for each of the instances of uh, the memory schedulers and data analytics accelerators. Each port that is shown in this diagram uh, with a bidirectional arrow uh, provides for 64 gigabytes per second per direction. And the latency of sending a request from one agent to another agent on this network is three nanoseconds unloaded. And the latency to receive data from a partition and send it to the farthest partition is six nanoseconds. So the network latency for sending a request and getting data is less than 10 nanoseconds. So here are some of the salient features of the L3. Um, the L3 interprocessor state is MOESI, and we've preserved that from the previous generation. But in addition, we've added a supplier state uh, to each cache line. And this supplier state identifies a partition as being the sole supplier of a cache line in case there are multiple sharers. So the reason is obvious. We don't want to swamp a requester or swamp the network with data uh, if there are multiple sharing partitions. The next three bullets might sound a little abstract, but when Sumti talks about um, uh, these, these features with examples, they'll become clearer. Um, so each L3 cache maintains um, the history of the requests issued by an application. And specifically, what we track is how a request is serviced, whether it's serviced by another partition, whether it's serviced by local memory, or whether it's serviced by a remote node. And this information is preserved in the L3, and it is used for making future requests and using the right flavor of the on-chip protocol to maximize performance. Um, idle partitions in that um, block diagram that you saw, idle partitions can be used as victim caches by other active partitions. So this can be useful when you're running the serial component of a throughput workload and you want to provide it with all the cache that it needs. Um, then you provide it with the ability to victimize into other partitions. Uh, the data analytics accelerators and the cores talk to each other, handshake with each other using the L3 as a buffer. Uh, specifically, uh, after finishing the uh, a data analytics operation or a query, the results can be deposited in the L3 for the, for the appropriate thread to consume. And we have an, algor we have an algorithm of discovery where uh, the data analytics accelerator can find out where the consuming thread resides and deposit the data in that appropriate partition. We also have this new feature on this chip called application data protection. So the entire cache hierarchy uh, has a pointer version. So we have extra metadata bits for pointer versions. And we've provided instruction set support for doing version checking on pointers. And this can be used for application data protection. And Steve will talk more about this uh, in the uh, M7 overview presentation. So the on-chip network that I showed in the block diagram that was running through the middle of the chip has three physical networks. There's a request network that consists of four broadcast rings. And uh, the salient points of this network is that it's a fixed latency network. Once a request gets on the ring, all the agents can see it within a fixed number of hops. That's 11. Um, so it, it goes from sender to receiver, all the receivers, uh, within 11 cycles, which works out to less than three nanoseconds. And the data network is constructed as a mesh of 10 ported switches. The cross-sectional bandwidth, so if you cut the OCN network with a knife, the bandwidth is uh, half a terabyte per second, um, and that's the bidirectional bandwidth. And the unloaded latency to get from 
any agent to any other agent on the network, on the data network, is less than six nanoseconds. The response network is a point-to-point -point network. And uh, the key point of the response network is that we perform aggregation of responses before sending a consolidated response to the, uh, to the requesting partition. Otherwise, you can imagine that the requesting partition can get swamped by responses from all partitions. Um, I'll just spend half a minute on this slide. So the SMP coherence protocol um, is, is directory based. So M7 can scale up from one to eight sockets using a glueless uh, directory based protocol. And scaling beyond eight sockets is accomplished using uh, coherency glue ASIC. The direct, di directory is partitioned like it was uh, in the previous generation T5 and M6 processors. But because our last level cache is completely different from what it was in the previous generation processors, we've had to look at uh, alternative organizations for the directory. So the directory that we've chosen is an inclusive tag rather than a precise mirror of the L3. Um, the size of the directory is larger than the size of the L3, but it is not as associative. So it's an 80 megabyte, 20 way set associative directory. And the directory is dynamically organized, so we can support all socket counts from one to eight uh, in a product. Um, at this point, I'll hand over the mic to Sumti. All right, thanks, Ram. Hello, everyone. I'll talk about mostly the features that Ram described, but also pick up some examples uh, on how we achieve uh, the goals which we are trying to achieve with this processor. So the first set of features that I'll talk about are mediated and peer-to-peer -peer requests and along with memory prefetch, and uh, show you that how this provides us uh, protocol choices that we can apply based on the address sharing characteristic of a workload. Next, I'll talk about dynamically partitioned cache. And uh, the main purpose of this feature is to redistribute the last level cache fairly among the uh, active number of threads on a workload. And last, I'll talk about the DAX allocation and how core and uh, DAX communication works efficiently. So first feature uh, said mediated and peer-to-peer -peer requests. So these two different protocol types. And the reason for designing these two was really as a workload runs on a processor and it spawns across multiple cores and multiple partitions. And if the workload has sharing, then there is a good chance that uh, L3 missed from one of the partition can be served by hit another partition on the same processor. So we wanted to provide this workload the, the least possible cache-to-cache -cache latency. And hence, uh, for that purpose, peer-to-peer -peer type of requests uh, serve that purpose. Uh, these are the broadcast requests. And all the partitions will pick up this request. They reply back uh, with data uh, from one partition to another partition, and hence uh, serving their purpose. Now, the workload that is running on a processor uh, might not be shared. Uh, and in that case, we want to get best memory latency. And uh, uh, the request types that are issued for that purpose are called mediated requests. These are unicast to coherence gateway. And uh, they are the fastest and the most power efficient uh, way of getting data from memory. Uh, let's look at a couple of diagrams that how these work. So same diagram as Ram described earlier, same processor. And in this case, one of the L3 has a miss, and it chooses to issue that request as a peer-to-peer -peer request. So L3 miss goes out. All the partitions on the network uh, pick up that request. They look up their directories. And key thing to note here is that they all respond back to the requesting agent. Um, and one of the partition on the processor might have a hit, and that partition supplies data back to the original requester. So, Lowest latency because you saw the, the, the coherence directory as well as memory controllers had no involvement in serving this request. Uh, just the, the issuing L3 resolved all the coherency related to it. Uh, in rare cases, peer-to-peer -peer requests might not have anybody who hits on the local processor. And hence, in that case, that request gets converted to mediated request that's then served by SMP gateway, there is no reissue requirement from the L3 that missed this request. So let's take a look at how mediated requests work. 
So L3 partition, in this case, chooses to issue mediated requests. It's a unicast to the SMP gateway. And uh, at the same time as SMP gateway is resolving currency on this one, memory controller is doing a prefetch from memory. And, and then finally, the data from memory controller goes back to the, uh, the original requester. And this is the lowest uh, latency part to memory as no other partition, the other seven on the chip, they were involved in, in serving this request. So we have these two mechanisms, and, uh, and the choice of them depends on if you know in advance that are you going to get your data via cache-to-cache -cache transfers or from memory. And that's what precisely L3 is tracking. It's uh, L3 is continuously recording and building heuristics that if its misses are getting served via cache-to-cache -cache transfers, then it'll issue more peer-to-peer -peer requests in future. Uh, high memory returns will drive it to issue more mediated requests. And it is tracking the temporal characteristic of a workload so that if workload changes its behavior, L3 adapts very quickly uh, to the new, new behavior of it. And also, L3 tracks code and data separately, because sharing characteristic of any workload on code versus data side could be quite different. To further optimize memory path, we certainly have memory prefetch. So it's a 256 entry deep uh, buffer on processor. Uh, it holds the prefetch data from memory, and certainly main purpose is to reduce latency. So as L3 miss arrives, data is served out of the prefetch buffer. It also absorbs evictions from L3 and hence reducing eviction latency. Now to further optimize uh, bandwidth on, on memory controller, as we know that our L3s are tracking cache to cache versus, uh, and, uh, versus data coming from memory. So L3 applies this knowledge before issuing any L3 miss and, and only does prefetches if they are necessary. So if data is getting served from on-chip cache-to-cache transfers or inter-chip cache-to-cache transfers, L3 knows I'm going to get this data from another cache anyways. Why bother sending a prefetch request? And then uh, prefetches are not issued for those kind of lines. Again, tracked independently for code and data because independent behavior on those two. So, here is a table that's summarizing how this is all put together, why we did all this. And uh, we have this series of features, and on the left side of this table, you see various workloads that run on any server or any processor. So virtual machines, databases, especially shared global area of database, analytics workloads, partitioned um, across cores. Uh, or any multi-threaded, multi-core program uh, with, with, and its control um, flow of it. And next to that is our two columns, which are uh, kind of summarizing their instruction and data side sharing behavior and what might exist in a given workload. So for example, second row databases. Independent processes acting on a common data to execute a query, you would expect that I side, instruction side, is not very well shared versus data is where it is like you'll see a heavy sharing on. Analytics workload, by definition, data has been chopped up and divided among cores. They are executing likely single program that's acting on it. So you'll expect heavily shared text versus not too much sharing on data. And Wherever you see not shared is where you want to apply uh, mediated uh, requests. Wherever you see shared, you want to apply peer-to-peer -peer requests. And that's exactly what L3 uh, uh, tracking counters are locking onto and uh, serving uh, their requests. Also, none of these workload is constant in time. So as it changes its behavior, L3 locks onto new behavior and issues the request. So that's how we get. The, the best latency across the set of workloads and, and applying those features that went into uh, workloads. So next feature, dynamically partitioned cache. Um, again, main purpose of this one was to be able to fairly redistribute the cache uh, among uh, variable number of threads or variable load. So let's see, what do we mean by variable load on a processor? So as a workload is running on a processor, it goes through multiple phases. One of, the, one of the phase or one of the duration could be which I'm calling a throughput duration, where pretty much all threads on the processor are running, and uh, it's a well parallelized workload. Data is divided, and, and it's using all the processor. As time passes by, 
this workload can go through uh, various states. So one of it could be that oh, thread, uh, the work is finishing and hence threads are stopping. Another one could be that threads are getting paused because a maintenance job need to be done on them like garbage collection. Another phase could be that uh, they all need to do a serial section of a code, like they all need to malloc, and hence they need to get into critical section and uh, do those things. Either one of this behavior will drive uh, the total thread running on a processor, the thread count will reduce, and, and the reduced number of threads will be doing garbage collection, serial action execution, or collecting results from the previous uh, part. And as those conditions resolve, it returns back to the throughput phase. The cycle keeps on repeating, uh, and it depends on workload to workload that how much time is spent in any one of these phases. Uh, but what's very clear is the partition cache is, is, is ideal for throughput part. Unified last level cache is ideal for serial part. And what we implement is dynamically partitioned cache on this processor. Uh, L3s adopt their behavior based on the workload that's running on, and with hypervisor assist, L3 partitions can join or disjoin based, based on the active threads on a, on a partition. Let's take a look at it with the example, how it works. Um, on the left side, I got a throughput phase or throughput duration of a workload. Here I'm showing just the four partitions, uh, just for saving the space here, and all of those partitions have active threads, and dirty evictions from them are uh, going to the memory controller. So every partition or threads running on every partition, they effectively see eight megabyte of uh, last level cache. Serial duration of the workload, what happens is the threads on other three partition wait or sleep, and hence from threading point of view, those partitions are idle, but their cache is joined with the active partition that's uh, running uh, still having the active threads, and hence uh, those, uh, the active threads get to see the larger uh, cache size. So this is how the, the, vic the victim caching and the dynamically partitioned cache works. Many more combinations possible depending on where the active threads were. I'm just picking up one uh, out of that. Cordax handshake. So on this processor, we introduce uh, DAX, Data Analytics Accelerator, and DAX is uh, DAX accelerates uh, specific query operations, and the database running on the processor is well aware of what those operations are. So it picks the right operations and assigns it to the DAX. DAX operates on the same address space on which uh, database or the process is running on the core are running. So, so DAX will pick up data directly from the database address space, read them in, process it, and deposit the results back and uh, into the same address space so that process can pick it up and, and use that. So it's very important for us to provide cache core and low latency high bandwidth communication between core and DAX, and, uh, and that's what we provide here. DAX are pretty much sitting on the same on-chip network as the cores are sitting on, and hence uh, they are behaving like cores, and they have all capabilities uh, of, of sharing data. I'll just quickly go through these uh, last couple of things. So DAX allocation, DAX is producing results, uh, providing results back to the, the process running on the core is the most important thing. So we do provide a, a mechanism in which the, the DAX can allocate directly into last level cache. And, um, and that's a choice made by user uh, code that whether it wants its results from the cache or from the memory. Since we never wanted to expose the, the cache hierarchy details, because that can change from processor to processor, processor, to processor um, uh, so user code, so we provide a feature of probe, um, and hence DAX can discover which partition uh, the, the, the DAX request was submitted from. And, uh, and hence deposit, it into the right, uh, the, deposit the results into the right partition. Let's see how that works. So as work is submitted to DAX, it issues a probe instruction and discovers where the active threads are. It uses those results then later on uh, to, to provide the data back into uh, the right partition. So in this case, a compressed stream of data is coming from memory. And uh, as DAX either deposits the raw data or the filter results into that uh, partition, and, uh, and then the threads running on that partition can pick up that data at L3 hit latency and hence also avoids any unnecessary ping pong on the, on the network on, on the processor itself. 
so summary, next generation Spark processor cache hierarchy significantly improves the SOC response time over previous generation, provides a low latency, high bandwidth, dynamically partitioned cache that actively tracks workload behavior and applies appropriate flavor of on-chip protocol for optimal performance, and uh, enables a low latency, high bandwidth DAX interface for effective offload of acceleration tasks. That concludes our talk, and at this point, Ram and I can take any questions you may have. Just a couple of things. I wanted to uh, uh, acknowledge the contributions of everyone who worked on the M7 program. Some of them are here at the conference. And I also wanted to thank Hot Chips for uh, giving us this opportunity. Thank you. We have time for a couple of questions. It looks like we have a few. Uh... Hi, Fred Weber. Um, your cache injection stuff with the DAX looks very interesting. You mentioned that um, you don't want the programmer to be aware of the cache hierarchy since it'll change, and so you have a mechanism for identifying where to deposit. But isn't it just as important to know how big the caches are and that sort of thing, so when you decide whether you're going to send data to cache or to memory, you know whether you will fit within the available space and issues like that? Yeah, so that part is kind of controlled inherently by hypervisor and the OS and when to allow and when to not allow, uh, those will be regulated accordingly. And also uh, allow results uh, deposit only on the filtered uh, portions or the whole, whole compressed streams, yeah. So from a programmer point of view, I just have the choice to say, I've got a relatively small amount of data or a big amount of data and that's the granularity? Yes, yeah, yes. yeah. Over here. Um, hello, um, my name is Olivier Giroux from NVIDIA. Um, do you guys still support the TSO versus RMO switch in your Spark processors? And, and if so, is, do you get the same scalability uh, to the multi-socket configuration when you switch it to TSO? So from a programmer standpoint, we support TSO. So internally, we might do some uh, different kinds of ordering, but we support TSO. And as far as your question of scalability is concerned, um, there are some benefits to doing relaxed ordering for uh, certain operations, um, like, say, garbage collection, for example. And uh, we do expose some of that relaxed ordering to Solaris, but the application will not see it. Okay, so for applications, it's TSO. Yes. Yeah. So uh, they ran a little over, so we'll take one more question to try to keep on time okay. over here. Yeah, Bill, Bill Rash from Intel. I have a question about the uh, directory cache. Uh, you said it was 80 megabytes, and I was wondering if you could add some more about where it's located in terms of, uh, is it partitioned by coherency link and the memory buffers? Just what, where is the 80 megabyte directory cache? Uh, it's located within the SMP and IO gateways that we showed in the block diagram. And the physical structure of the directory cache identifies the location of the sharers. So imagine that you have a physically partitioned directory cache with, say, eight partitions. If you hit on more, more than one partition out of those eight, you know exactly which nodes have the data. OK, thank you. And uh, for, they'll be down here for questions uh, later on. Uh, so thank you very much. All right, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so our next speaker is Michael Schwen from uh, IBM, uh, talking about unchaining the data center with open power. Uh, Michael is a senior technical staff member and senior manager of system architecture in IBM's systems and technology group, where he leads the power and mainframe architecture. Michael has been a lead architect and design lead in the definition of the development of the DAISY and BOE binary translation processors, the Cell Broadband Engine, Xbox 360, Water News Media Accelerator, Blue Gene Q, Power 7, Power 8, and several generations of IBM mainframe processors. In addition to his hardware leadership, Michael has also developed the first Cell compiler and served as a technical lead for the first Cell BE software environment, and more recently, for the Open Power software in, um, environment. Michael? Thank you, Forrest. So uh, I'm excited to be here today to talk about how uh, a consortium of uh, large-scale data center industry players are changing the industry, uh, bringing uh, competition 
and an influx of uh, new architectural innovation to uh, the data center with uh, the creation of open power. And I'll also be talking about how uh, we re-engineered the server ecosystem uh, for large-scale data centers. So uh, open power was created to bring choice to large-scale data centers, the choice to differentiate, the choice to innovate, and the choice to grow. The choice to differentiate is a choice for uh, data center architects to build workload-optimized solutions and use best-of-breed uh, components from an open, broad ecosystem. The choice to innovate is a choice uh, to allow data center architects to collaborate uh, and, uh, collab and collaboratively innovate in an open ecosystem with open interfaces. And the choice to grow is a choice to grow the delivered uh, system performance by bringing new capabilities to systems instead of uh, relying on uh, technology scaling that is running out of steam. So if you look at uh, the data center landscape today, there are two uh, competing forces uh, that are shaping the landscape. On the one hand, there is the need for standardization. On the other hand, there is the need for innovation. Uh, from one side, uh, the proposed model is that uh, economies of scale enable data center optimization, and uh, that hardware development can leverage consumer scale volumes and uh, build uh, data center servers and uh, simplify software development by uh, developing programs for a known software stack and uh, increase uh, higher pro uh, programmer productivity that way. That model is sometimes called uh, x86 everywhere by some of its proponents. Uh, but uh, that model stymies the need for innovation in data centers. Uh, and we've gone out to uh, data center players and uh, talked with their architects. And what we heard from them was a need to optimize uh, systems for the data center servers to increase uh, the value of uh, data center servers by optimizing them for the workloads and differentiate them. Uh, but at the same time, to ensure software portability to uh, create platform choice and to allow uh, data center architects to optimize uh, for their workloads. In other words, uh, the message was uh, loud and clear that uh, one size does not fit all. So uh, with that background, uh, a consortium of uh, data center suppliers and operators got together uh, to create open power, to jointly create a vibrant open ecosystem for data centers and to expand the options for large-scale data center uh, computing, and to create an ecosystem where ultimately the software stacks that are enabled by that ecosystem uh, define the value of the ecosystem. Uh, on the one hand, by protecting investment in existing software stacks, but at the same time also by enabling new innovation and uh, enabling uh, the creation of workload-optimized software-defined uh, data center uh, software stacks of the future. So um, looking at the open power uh, framework, uh, the open power ecosystem uh, creates a set of hardware standards, standardized hardware interfaces uh, that allow uh, participants in the ecosystem to uh, create interoperable systems and uh, advertise common open firmware interfaces. On top of that, uh, the open power software stack uh, enables data center operators uh, to optimize uh, these systems for, for their applications and allows uh, original design manufacturers uh, to tune and, uh, systems and to offer compatible systems. For open power, this uh, software stack is built on uh, the, an open source stack uh, consisting of Linux and KVM, running on top of uh, the Power8 system that IBM introduced uh, last year. Uh, to simplify uh, the porting of uh, large-scale data center applications, uh, the open power software stack uh, uses a little Indian data format. Uh, this enables, uh, simplifies the porting of uh, applications that were originally developed in little Indian ecosystems. Uh, that have dependencies on uh, little Indian data formats in their source code or in their storage. 
And it also enables uh, the, ex the use of uh, I.O. Uh, components and accelerators that were originally created for mobile or for uh, PC platforms. The open power environment is not uh, the traditional power Linux uh, system with a new name. It represents a significant discontinuity and a fresh start. It's a new environment in the Linux distribution. It consists of new firmware, a new hypervisor, new data layout, new source code. It has a new ABI. So let's have a look at uh, what changes for application developers. First off, I already mentioned that uh, the byte ordering, the data format for uh, open power will be little endian. We also took advantage of uh, the discontinuity that this introduction represents to introduce a new optimized ABI for uh, open power, as well as a new vector programming API. In terms of uh, the timeline for the creation of this new ecosystem, uh, this was extremely was an extremely rapid turnaround project, so it wasn't a sort of big company project uh, that involved the long discussion phase, uh, but uh, rather was more a startup within the company with strong support from our CEO. The first discussions about this uh, environment were back uh, last March, and uh, by October, uh, the Linux distributions were already starting uh, to build the new environment with the new tooling that was available. And within a short time, 40,000 package, packages were running in the new environment. So um, let's turn to the uh, open power application binary interface. An ABI is uh, the protocol, the language with which uh, application components talk to each other. And uh, in defining the new open power ABI, we started with uh, the PowerPC64 uh, ABI that's used uh, on Big Indian Linux and AIX. It's a high-performance uh, established uh, uh, ABI uh, that uh, is implemented uh, in many systems and has uh, stable production code. Uh, and uh, starting out with that uh, basis uh, allows uh, shared maintenance and uh, common uh, code uh, optimization between uh, the different power environments. It also simplifies uh, enabling uh, all the different compilers and uh, just-in-time uh, translators, uh, libraries, middleware, et cetera, that all need to be enabled for the new ecosystem. On top of that trusted base, we define new capabilities as a delta over that baseline. Uh, with the goals of aligning with a broader ecosystem to allow programmers that were coming to the platform uh, from other systems to have an immediate familiarity with that environment, uh, to create hardware optimization opportunities and synergies, and to optimize for mo modern code patterns. If you look at modern code, you'll find the use of more classes, of more data abstraction. You'll find that code typically has shorter function lengths You'll also find that there are more indirect function calls in the form of uh, virtual functions, uh, in the form of more data abstraction. Above all, uh, for anything uh, that wasn't uh, broken, we di uh, didn't fix it. So uh, there was a, a desire to focus on where we could differentiate uh, above uh, the prior systems. So uh, let me turn to some of these optimizations that we did. Many of those uh, revolve around data access with a global offset table. That's a data dictionary, if you will, uh, that applications use to find their global data. And some of the optimizations that we performed are uh, initializing the got pointer, the pointer that points to that data dictionary, optimizing how that pointer is updated, saved, and restored when you go across modules, and expanding the maximum size of that uh, table that can be efficiently addressed. So let's look at uh, the global offset table. Um, as I mentioned, uh, the global offset table, or GOT, is a data dictionary that uh, helps applications find their global data. It uh, holds the addresses of those data, and there is uh, a pointer that uh, points somewhere within that uh, structure uh, that the application uses to to access uh, the data dictionary. 
There are typically two ways to use the data dictionary. One is uh, to uh, load an address of uh, data from the got, and then use that address to access the actual data. That's typically used for shared global data, where multiple modules share a data item, and so each module has a pointer to the shared data item. Or you can also directly access a data item as an offset from the got pointer, and uh, that's typically used for private data within the module. Each module has its own uh, got data dictionary, and when you perform cross-module calls, uh, the got pointer needs to be saved, and the new pointer needs to be loaded that uh, points to the module that's being called. So, in compiling code for functions uh, with the new ABI, the compiler generates uh, two entry points into each function, uh, one which is a local entry point uh, that assumes that uh, the got is shared, the got pointer is shared uh, by a call from a, another function within the same module, so the pointer doesn't need to be loaded. Then there is a second entry point when the same function is called from an external module, from another module that may have a different got pointer, and so a got pointer for the current module needs to be established. The linker then is responsible for when, it, when a call is made, and uh, it's locally resolved within the module to point the call instruction to link that directly into the local entry point. When a function cannot be resolved within the current module, then uh, the linker inserts a trampling uh, piece of code, commonly known as uh, procedure linkage table, that calls the dynamic linker and then performs a register indirect call to the address of the function returned by the dynamic linker. All indirect calls, including those uh, from the trampoline code here, uh, go through the global entry pointer and uh, leave the function address in register 12 so that uh, the called function uh, can use that to establish addressability. Turning to uh, optimizing got pointer safes uh, at the transition between modules, um, the compiler and the linker collaborate to optimize uh, where these uh, save and restore points occur in, to reduce the GOT management overhead. Uh, so to do that, the compiler establishes the optimal point for performing the GOT uh, save uh, in a calling function. And when the linker resolves a function call to an external module, and only then does it insert a got save instruction at that point uh, indicated by the compiler. So let's look at uh, what this means for actual application code. On the left-hand side, you see code uh, is, uh, would typically be generated by uh, previous ABIs uh, for different architectures. So as you go from the left-hand side, uh, that uh, little loop there, uh, and make a call that's uh, to a function in another module. Uh, you go through that uh, trampoline code, that PLT code, and um, somewhere along that uh, transition between modules, the got pointer will be saved. You pass on, you execute that short function, and when you come back, uh, uh, the old got value will be reloaded. So two things, when you have the transition between two modules, within a loop, for example, you perform that, you save the same got value over and over and over on every iteration. And also, if you call a very short function to add insult to injury, you'll end up waiting for the store to complete before it can be loaded back. Uh, with the new ABI, the compiler establishes a point that would be, for example, above that loop, at the loop preheader, and when the linker establishes that it's an external call, it'll insert the got save at that point, and it will be only executed once. The compiler also has the opportunity to separate the store from a load in this way to avoid uh, any queuing effects where a load uh, needs to uh, wait for a store to complete. Finally, uh, let's look at uh, extending the size of the data dictionary. Uh, with the new a uh, ABI, we introduce uh, or expand uh, our 
uh, code models by, uh, with a medium code model that uh, supports a data dictionary size of up to 4 gigabyte uh, by using a 32-bit uh, offset into the uh, global offset table. The size of the data dictionary is typically constrained by the displacement range you find in instruction sets and the fixed width risk instructions being 32-bit uh, bits uh, commonly. Uh, and the displacement of 16 bits that made 64 kilobyte uh, the natural dictionary size in the past. And that gives access to about 8,000 variables. In the past, this has been enough. As we're talking more about big data, big data means a lot of data, 8,000 variables is not always enough. There is code to handle that situation in ABIs even today uh, with uh, the medium code model. Uh, we have uh, another tool uh, that uh, is available to application programmers. It's the default uh, for the new platform, but it will also be available for other power platforms. It enables applications to grow beyond the 8,000 variables to up to 500 million variables uh, per module without any overhead. And it uses that uh, in conjunction with a new piece of microarchitecture uh, that we introduced in Power8 for displacement function. And that allows uh, Power8 to go beyond the limits of traditional risk architectures. You see, when Power8 recognizes a sequence of instruction to use expanded addressing, for example, an at first add immediate shifted instruction that provides a number of high order bits to use an addressing followed by load instruction that provides low order bits uh, to use as offset. It can recognize that and combine it into a single load instruction that has that bigger offset and executes uh, with the same high performance and the same uh, low resource usage as a traditional risk load instruction and uh, offer the same performance benefits while having the addressing range of uh, 32 bits that is typically only a possible with a variable width instruction encoding. Um, finally, uh, we also made some improvements to uh, function calls. Uh, and in particular, with a goal to reduce uh, the penalty associated with uh, data abstraction. Our goal was to uh, make uh, abstract data types have the same performance as built-in data types. You see, if uh, ob object-oriented languages uh, wrap the basic data types uh, in uh, a class, to be able to define new operators, to define new functions on them. And uh, most common ABIs pass uh, classes in memory. Uh, the Power ABI, the traditional Power ABI, passes classes in GPRs and returns them in memory. Uh, but we wanted to be be uh, do better than that. We wanted to pass each data type in its natural register, even when classes are involved. So integer members of classes and general purpose registers and floating point uh, class members and floating point registers, etc. So the way we accomplish that is we focus on uh, the most common types of uh, classes, the ones with homogeneous aggregates, that is uh, classes that have uh, similar class member types to reduce the complexity and simplify uh, the code that is necessary to support uh, passing uh, uh, class members in up to eight registers uh, on each function invocation. Uh, we then also expect uh, return values from functions back in the same registers, so uh, that uh, improves performance for uh, codes that use data abstraction to the same uh, performance that you might expect for built-in data types uh, by reducing the overhead of uh, handling classes differently. For example, the C++ uh, complex class now has the same performance as uh, you might get with uh, the complex built-in type, uh, even if uh, inlining isn't available. Overall, across a broad set of uh, object-oriented codes, that leads to several percent uh, performance improvement just uh, with this one optimization. Now, let me turn to uh, the open power vector SIMD programming model. And uh, in defining that uh, programming model, we wanted uh, to give those programmers that choose to uh, 
vectorize their code themselves rather than relying on vectorizing compilers, a better set of tools to write uh, that code and have the compiler optimize even that code. By departing from a tradition where each uh, built-in function corresponded one-to-one -to, -one to one hardware instruction, but rather have the programmer specify what operations to perform and then have the compiler optimize that. Um, we also wanted to enable programmers to both write uh, high-performance uh, little endian uh, programs uh, that uh, were either coming from another little endian platform or that were being developed uh, for an open power little endian environment. But we also wanted to enable programmers that had applications that they had written in a big endian environment. For example, many of the power uh, middleware uh, that is optimized for, to exploit vector architecture to simplify portability. So to do that, we introduced two variants of a new vector uh, programming model. One which we call the true Lalandian vector model. It's uh, the default programming model, and it's focused on uh, programmability. It's consistent with a Lalandian programming view that uh, you would see on other Lalandian platforms. And uh, it's focused on sharing code with those Lalandian platforms. When you load vectors, when you uh, refer to vector elements uh, consistently, data is referred to in a right to left order. As you can see here, uh, when you load uh, a vector uh, that consists of 16 bytes, the bytes are placed from right to left into the vector register. The elements are also enumerated from right to left. So consistently little endian. However, if you have some code that has big endian code dependencies uh, and that expects uh, vector elements to uh, be aligned from left to right, uh, we have a second model that we call big and little uh, that uh, is focused on portability from big endian environments for code that uh, has assumptions about uh, big endian data ordering within registers. When we load uh, values in that model, we still load the individual data elements from right to left, so you still are working on little endian data, but the view of the register in terms of uh, the vector elements, those are enumerated left to right. And uh, so if you have code dependencies on big endian ordering, that uh, uh, code will uh, operate correctly. In terms of code generation, uh, these two a APIs can be selected by the programmer. Uh, the native default environment is uh, the true little Indian environment. And both of these uh, models translate to the same compiler intermediate code and can be optimized by the compiler, uh, generating the best possible code uh, regardless of uh, the provenance of the original source code. So with that, uh, the open power environment is available now. You can get it from uh, your favorite Linux distributors. Uh, several uh, of those distributions are now available with the new PowerPC uh, 64 Little Endian environment. And uh, based on that, we see that uh, collaborative in innovation is already changing the industry. We see, we've talked to uh, major data center stakeholders that are interested in joining, that have joined Open Power, that help, have helped in creating Open Power. Um, with uh, the creation of Open Power, with the Open Power ecosystem, we have redefined the software stack for power consisting of a new firmware, new hypervisors, operating systems, and applications that uh, use a little endian data model for simplified application porting from uh, environments that may de be dependent on that. And uh, Linux distributions are available now. Over 40,000 packages have been ported. IBM Software Group products are also available for that new environment. Um, the new open power environment enables uh, ease of use and out-of-the-box performance for, uh, ap uh, for applications coming from other platforms and uh, to exploit new Power 8 hardware features. So uh, with that, I'm concluding my talk, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Let's 
see. Uh, we have one question over here. I'm Mike Brazzoni with Camp Marketing. Can you go into some detail about CAPI, the complementary processor interface, the state of the standard, when it's going to be publicly disseminated, if more processor types get to play besides NVIDIA GPU, ARM, FPGA, DSP, everyone but Intel? Uh, anything you can talk about the standards publication would be greatly appreciated. So, uh, we first introduced, uh, and my colleague Jeff Stukley, who was uh, giving a talk about Power 8 last year, uh, was uh, talking about CAPI. And uh, so it's one of the high performance interfaces that uh, are available to Power 8. It uh, will be available for uh, the Open Power members. So uh, we'll uh, use the Open Power uh, Consortium, the Open Power Foundation, as uh, the place where uh, that uh, sort of uh, development and collaboration built around Power 8 features, whether that's uh, CAPI or some of the other features that uh, we have discussed uh, or that uh, my colleague uh, Alex Maricas will be discussing uh, in the next session uh, can, can be exploited and uh, innovated around uh, by uh, others in the industry. So that gentleman will be able to provide a timeline of when uh, facets of the standard are going to be publicly disseminated? I'm um, not the right person to discuss this in this forum, so I'm um, not authorized to discuss specific dates uh, for the purpose of this discussion. I will be focusing on the open power software ecosystem. Thank you. Okay, another question over here. Uh, Satoshi Matsuchi, NEC. Uh, a lot of software in the data center is compiled by GCC, including the Linux. And then are you proposing the you're pro pro proposing new ABI interface? And then that is uh, you are assuming that it is uh, included in the GCC, or the proposing a new two chain? That uh, new ABI is uh, included in uh, the GCC in the new versions of GCC. It's available also as part of uh, the newest versions of LLVM in IBM's proprietary Excel compiler and Java chits uh, that you can uh, obtain from IBM and others, as well as uh, the appropriate uh, libraries and, uh, that come with Linux and uh, uh, the Linux operating system. So it's fully enabled. It's uh, out there, uh, submitted in the open source uh, repositories for Linux, for the uh, tool chain, et cetera. And uh, if you want to look, for example, to OpenSUSE, they have uh, the uh, OpenSUSE factory where they do nightly builds. They have those running uh, with Little Indian. Uh, Canonical is distributing a version of that and has uh, for several months now. So it's all out there, the source code uh, and uh, distributions that you can download and install on your systems. Uh, do you have any comment? <laughs> that, was a, that was a good question and a very good answer. Uh, uh, do you have any comment on the difference between uh, GCC and uh, property, IBM proprietary tools? They're, they're all interoperable. It's, uh, we've uh, worked across uh, the different parts of IBM with, uh, to, to make sure that uh, they all implement the same uh, interfaces and have interoperable code as you've always come to expect uh, from other power environments. Thank you. Any more questions? Well, if not, let's uh, thank Michael for a fascinating talk. So our final paper in this session uh, is from uh, Intel and will be given by uh, Brad Burris. Uh, Brad is a BS in, uh, uh, in computer engineering from University of Arizona and a master's in EE from Westchester Polytech Institute. He has worked for Intel for 17 years across communications, embedded, and server space. He drove the Atom server concept and went on to be the Abiton Atom C2000 lead architect. Brad is now working on next generation Atom and Xeon servers. He's a pr senior principal engineer. Uh, his talk is uh, Intel C2000 Atom microserver, uh, power efficient processing for the data center. Brad? Thank you. Is the uh, remote up here? Oh, there it is. All right, thanks, Boris. Right, nice to see everybody. I wanted to talk about the Intel Atom microserver family 
And I want to acknowledge my uh, other architects, Johan van de Gronendal, Jonathan Robinson, and Ian Steiner, um, all who couldn't make it, but would love to be here presenting to you today. A uh, little light reading for you guys from the Intel legal department. And what I'm here to do today is talk about Abiton and introduce you to that product. Um, this is Intel's, uh, really our second generation 64-bit SOC. Uh, we are, um, it's really the first one developed by Intel um, from the ground up to be, a, to, to target the data center. Um, and it's really, it, it's a combination of our client uh, experience and SOCs and in kind of modular building blocks. And we've merged that with our uh, sort of our Xeon and high performance efficiencies. Um, so it's really a merging of two sides of the house at Intel um, to get a, a really interesting and compelling product. Um, I should say this product actually went into production at the end of last year in Q4. Um, so this is available now. And uh, earlier this year it was named as the Microprocessor Reports Client and Server Processor of the Year. Um, so it's been received really well. Um, this is based on the next generation Intel Atom microprocessor, Atom uh, microarchitecture known as Silvermont. We're going to talk a bit about that. That's really sort of the, the crown jewel of the Abiton product. And it's focused on enabling high density with high, with high performance. Um, and so when we say high density, what does that mean? And if you look at a typical rack in a data center, um, when you have, say, a Xeon, you'll get in a 40U rack, you might have um, one or two Xeons per, per 1U uh, rack slot. When you look at a, an Aviton-based um, rack, you'll see something on the order of 10x that. So you're going to get you know, maybe 400, maybe as many as 1,000 servers in the same 40 or 44-year uh, server. So you can have a whole lot of server nodes um, within kind of that same volumetric footprint. And you get that through um, Aviton's you know, reduced footprint, reduced power consumption, um, and, and just simpler system. Um, so that's one of the things we've really been focused on enabling. And so we do that with, uh, by providing two up through eight core processors and offering anywhere in the range of 5 to 20-ish 20, 20 watts in that individual uh, processor. So that's really targeting out these scale-out workloads that are coming, coming to market now. Um, actually, as the last presenter said, um, you know, we are, you know, he mentioned the fact that it's not one size fits all anymore, and I think Intel has is, is very much realized that, which is why we, we got, jumped on board um, and, and we're first to market with a, a small core microserver. Um, and you also see that in other product offerings Intel has, such as the Intel Phi line. Um, and so we're really focused on growing that microserver and storage segments and provide IA solutions everywhere. Uh, so you see here is the Aviton block diagram. It's sort of a simplified view of what our chip looks like. Um, we sort of segment it into two sides. So you see the, on the top of the picture, there's um, what we call the north complex. So this is the, really the, the compute complex. Uh, the Silvermont core is built as a two-core pair. So we have two Silvermont cores sharing an, a, a single one meg L2 cache. And then we array that out four different times um, to give you a total of eight, up to eight cores and uh, up to four megabytes of L2. Um, Below that sits the system agent. So this system agent is really the path to both memory and I.O. and provides all the coherence across the system. Um, and then, and this is the first Atom-based product where we've gotten rid of the front side bus, which is sort of the old Intel legacy bus to provi provide access to memory, and replaced it with IDI, a much more higher performant interface. Um, and then in the bottom part, what we call the south complex, is really our I.O. subsystem. So that's where we have access to all the PCIe devices, that's where we have integrated Ethernet, we have USB, uh, we have you know, six SATA ports available. And then we have all the other things that kind of make IA IA and gives you that full x86 compatibility. So that's you know, your high performance timers, that's your 8259, that's um, you know, your spy interface, things like that. And all of this is made on a single die, so only one chip's required. Um, the other thing we've done is is we created, based on the Aviton product, we created another product called Rangely. So this is really the, a derivative based off of Aviton, where we've taken Aviton and extended it. Um, and you can see that this is really targeting comms and networking for things like line cards, for security appliances, um, for routers and switches. Um, so in order to get there, we have to do a few things. We have to change the reliability profile, so we need to make sure um, it'll last longer when it's in the field. 
We need to make sure that product's available to our customers to buy for a longer period of time. And we have to make sure it operates correctly at much wider temperature ranges because these may get deployed you know, outside in a you know, cell tower or somewhere like that where you need to go support colder and hotter temperatures. Um, and then we've, used, we've created this thing called the Quick Assist technology, uh, which is, we actually use to accelerate these various communications workloads. So, so what does that mean? Um, so, so, so we've actually enabled accelerating of these workloads through both software and hardware innovations. Um, one thing we've done is created a, a software ecosystem called the Data Plane Development Kit. This is an open source set of libraries that are really focused on providing a runtime, real-time environment um, uh, with a bunch of packet processing libraries underneath it that help you to, to move data along through the, through the chip. Um, and it's optimized for Rangely as well as a handful of other Intel Silicon products. Um, and then underneath that, we built something called the Quick Assist Technology Accelerators. Um, and there's a, a single API we've exposed that can either provide direct access to the hardware or can, has been incorporated into several open stack standards like OpenSSL. And that lets you take advantage of um, different hardware accelerators that live on the chip. So this is you know, various ciphers like uh, AES, Triple DES, Kazumi, uh, Snow3G. Um, it's a bunch of authentication protocols like SHA and MD5, um, as well as kind of your, your standard uh, public key, you know, RSA, Diffie-Hellman, uh, elliptic curve cryptography blocks as well. Okay, so that's the two products. What makes those two great? I mentioned this earlier. It's really the Silvermont microarchitecture. Um, this has been a, a really big change along the Atom family line, and it's a really big improvement, um, much, much more performance, much more power efficiency gain in a single generation than, than we typically see. Um, you, one of the things they've done is they provide a lot of high performance without sacrificing performance efficiency. So the, the Atom team did a tremendous job here, um, and they, they did, took a very analytic approach to, um, to coming up with these performance optimizations, and what they did is they went through and they said, we're only going to add a performance optimization if we get at least one-to-one -one performance increase with power increase. Um, and so they actually, for everything they contemplated, they actually modeled it in a performance model and si simulated it to see the performance gain and, and ran it through our power models to see what the power gains were too. Uh, so with that, we, we didn't have to sacrifice our power efficiency in order to get high performance. Um, one of the big things, the, probably the biggest thing they did to get there is this is the first generation of Atom that went from an in-order machine to an out-of-order machine. So that's really the biggest innovation. They did a bunch of other things to get this, this higher performance. Uh, the second thing we, that the Atom team did was they focused on you know, changes that can give them both power and performance efficiency. And this really meant that we had to completely re-architect our, our whole branch pipeline um, with you know, better processing, better predictors, and better recovery pipelines. And then finally, the, the third thing that really made Silvermont such a big improvement was uh, a focus on access to memory. So this is improving the access to the caches, um, both in and out of it, and enabling out-of-order memory transactions. And really, I mentioned that change to IDI, which gives us much better access to, to DRAM as we're going along. All of that combines together to get you know, a 2x improvement in single-threaded performance. Um, or, if you look at it from a power perspective, at ISO performance, you get a 5x lower power. So it's really a, a huge step forward. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, on top of you know, this performance and power gain, um, this is really where you see Atom grow up. So Atom um, really focused on the three, these three pillars here of performance, virtualization, and security. And, and you see that you know, Atom became compliant with Westmere ISA at this point in time, so now we have um, you know, Atom Core that really is, you know, sort of caught up with modern big day x86 processing. Um, and added a bunch of other things like SSE 4.1 and PrefetchW. It, it also worked to add, you know, virtualization capabilities into Atom that weren't previously there. Um, so you see things like VM Funk coming on board. And then you focus on the security side and adding a bunch of instructions like AES and I, which allows you to do AES in the core in a really efficient manner, or PC mobile QDQ, which is also good for CRC or, or SHA algorithms. Um, and read RAND, which is an instruction that lets you get a random number generated on a random number generated on die, but through an instruction interface. And we also focused, those are the new instructions. We also had a bunch of new technologies um, that, that also extended those three pillars as well. Um, so all of that really came to Atom maturing into this really compelling product um, 
microarchitecture, and it's, you know, gives us that full IA capability where we're matching Westmere or greater capabilities. All right, so we improve the core so that it, you know, we, you know, kind of say we upgraded out into a BMW. So we really needed to do something to, to improve the, the road. So I think of the Silvermont system agent as the roads uh, for Adam to drive on. So, so the system agent is what provides access for Adam to get, get out to memory, to get out to I.O., um, as the interface to the power management units. So this is really, um, really needed to be upgraded on all fronts. And, and so, you know, we've got now out of order implementation. The design was made to be very scalable. So this system agent actually can scale from our cell phone parts all the way up through our Atom microservers here, because um, it's been designed for modularity and scalability. Um, and it provides, you know, up to 25 gigabytes of memory bandwidth. It provides lots of I.O. bandwidth. Um, and it's kind of designed in the Nehalem style crossbar architecture. And I should say the real focus was on balancing. So, you know, we're, we're very focused on the Atom side as creating a completely balanced system. Um, on the Aviton memory side, so we have two channels of DDR, supports DDR3 and DDR3L, getting up to 16 mega transfers per second per channel um, with a peak bandwidth of 25 gigabytes. Uh, we also have a capacity of up to 64 gigabytes, and this is really a, a pretty large capacity that you can get to on, uh, from what we've seen from other small core offerings today. Um, also, since, again, this was designed from scratch as an enterprise product, so we really um, made sure that we did things uh, to make it make sense in the, in the data center. Um, and so that's things like, you know, DRAM failure protection with ECC, patrol and data scrub so that you can fix data uh, if you see single bit errors or detect double bit errors. Um, and we provided a lot of data path parity protection, both on the memories and to the I.O. Um, Okay, so that's kind of the compute, the north section we talked about. Um, now, the, if, the, if the system agent in the north is the kind of the road for, for the core, then the, the IOSF in the south, which is our Intel on-chip system fabric, um, is really the kind of the, the set of roads for I.O. on the south. Um, so what we looked at is we said, hey, there's a lot of great fabrics out there in the industry. You look at Amber, you look at OCP. Um, and they have a lot of really compelling characteristics. They're very scalable. They're very easy to use. Um, it was very different from what we had internal to Intel. Um, but they didn't provide kind of that PCI uh, usefulness that, that we, we want and need to, to keep our x86 uh, compatibility and, and flexibility of software. And so what we did is we took kind of those best characteristics of those fabrics, the best characteristics of PCI, and we merged it all into this thing called IOSF. And now we use IOSF internally across the company um, to really provide kind of that same thing OCP or AMBA will give you. Um, but with, you know, all the things that make IAIA and all the things that like the PCIe ordering rules and things like that, that, that let us port software really simply and don't have to push that burden to, to software programmers. The other thing we did is um, this is the first product we integrated Intel Ethernet onto. So a single die, all the IO we said, but we also integrated uh, what's known the Intel PowerVille design, the i350, which is, I think, the most widely deployed Ethernet solution to date. It's a four gig, a four one gig, a four port one gig solution has been integrated on die. And on top of integrating a design we had in house, we extended it and we did things like add 2.5 gigabit Ethernet, um, which is kind of a pseudo Ethernet standard, on on the, into this design as well. So that you know, you, as we're transitioning from one gig to 10 gig in that time frame, we wanted to make sure we had something in the middle too. So you can get up to 10 gig with us if you want to, um, with a four by 2.5, um, or you could have one or two ports of that just for give you better flexibility instead of just one gig building blocks. It also has support for onboard, you know, management interfaces to the BMC and um, supports kind of your traditional PCIe AR um, advanced error reporting techniques. Um, aside from Ethernet, we integrated other high-speed IOs. We have uh, an enterprise-based, enterprise-capable PCIe controller. Um, so we have 16 lanes of PCIe Gen 2. Um, providing up to 80 gigabits of, of total throughput. Um, this is spans across four different root ports, so you can support uh, a single by 16 device um, and scale that all the way down to four by four devices. Um, and then on top of that, we have six lanes of SATA. So we have two lanes of SATA 3, really focused on enabling, um, you know, getting the most out of things like SSDs. 
Um, and then we have another four ports that are SATA 2 based that are enable um, you know, more scalable drives so you can have a lot more capacity if you want to attach that onto the device. Um, and then we integrated all the other PCH stuff like I mentioned, so USB 2, um, the RTC, the real-time clock, the 8259, the IO APIC, uh, the UARTs, all of that stuff, all on die, so you don't need anything external. Um, and then we have a power management controller both in the north and the south, so one that controls you know, all of the turboing algorithms in the north and one that's controlling all of the IO power states in the south, um, as well as a bunch of SM bus controllers that let you interface with your platform and the system around you. So basically, this gives you all of those traditional IA feature sets that, that everyone's used to. Okay, so that's what the product looks like. And I mentioned this before, right? Silvermont was a big step forward. It's giving us you know, 2x peak-to-peak -peak performance um, on, a, on a single core, single threaded uh, comparison. It's also giving us 2x ISO power, or 2x performance at ISO power. So in a fixed power envelope, you can still get that 2x improvement on a single thread. Um, and then also, if you want to hold uh, performance constant, you can really drive the, you know, scale the voltage down and drive the power lower, and you get a 5x improvement. Um, so it's really a, a compelling, compelling step forward. So we take that, we array it out, and we get you know, significant performance improvements on Aviton versus the prior gen um, microserver we had at Intel called Centerton. And that's what you're looking at here. So, um, if you look at the, the bar on the left, which has Atom S1260, that's the Centerton um, performance, which is normalized to a value of one. So you can see on Java workloads, we're getting as much as you know, a 14x improvement from Centerton to Aviton across the whole SOC. Um, for things like memcache and object caching use models, we're getting you know, up to almost 10x improvement or, or 7x, depending on what your benchmark is. Front end web, which is one of the places we see micro uh, Microsoft is doing very well. Um, we're seeing a, a seven, more than a 7x improvement. And then on that general computing um, benchmark, which is one we use a lot, we use Backint, um, we're seeing a, you know, a greater than 5x improvement from center to, to, to Aviton. Um, and that kind of goes hand in hand with the memory bandwidth improvement of more than 4x. Um, so you can see you know, the, the generational gain from a center product to an Aviton product is, is really, really compelling. Um, so if you look at focusing in now on that general purpose computing thing, as we mentioned, we had Centerton down at one, going to um, up to almost six when you're at a, a 2.4 gigahertz eight core Atom, Aviton. Um, and then it's a little bit under 5x improvement when you're in that Atom C2730, so it's the, 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 the reduced frequency core, um, which is it coming in at 12 watts. And that 12 watts versus the Centerton one is actually pretty similar in terms of power um, because it's, you know, if you're looking at it, it's three and a half watts different, but we've integrated so many more things onto Aviton, like the Ethernet controller um, and other things, that that 12 watt CPU is sort of at power parity with the Centerton design. Um, and then we tried to compare this to the other microservers on the market, um, but at least at the time we put these together to preparation for the, the conference. Um, there's really not a lot out there to compare it to yet. So, you know, while we were out in Q4 of last year, we're, we're pretty far out in front of, of our competition at this point in time on the, on the microservice side. Um, so we looked at the Marvell Armada, you know, obviously they're, they're limited by the fact that they have a really small memory footprint coming with the ARM 32-bit processors. Um, so they, they only got it to, you know, a third of what Centerton could do. Um, and then Calcheda was, um, was looking at, you know, roughly two, roughly two-thirds of what Centerton can do. So, so Aviton has some pretty compelling performance leadership at this point. Um, looking in a little bit more on the front end web, because again, that's a place where we see microserver having a lot of um, uptake. You know, going from Centerton to, to Aviton, we got almost, you know, a seven to eight X improvement, um, whereas Marvell and Calcheda um, our Marvell's at roughly, you know, roughly parity with Center Tin, and Calcheda had was all, you know, basically two x of Center Tin. Um, that's the graph on the left. The graph on the right is not performance, but it's actually performance per watt. Again, you see a, a six x improvement going from Center Tin to Aviton, um, but Marvell we actually weren't able to accurately measure per performance per watt. 
And on the Calcheta side, we got, you know, they did a pretty good job here. They're up at 3.38 uh, X center 10 performance, but still half of what Avaton was giving you. Um, this is all based on, PA, on the LAMP stack, so running front end web benchmarks on uh, Linux with Apache, um, MySQL, and PHP. OK, so you know, I look at those numbers, and, and we feel really good about how Avaton's performing and what it's looking like. So the question is, is you know, what do we do to get here? Um, we talked a lot about Silvermont. Clearly, the core is, is the single biggest reason we got here. Um, but we also did some really interesting things. right? We, we, we took advantage of Intel's processor leadership um, and built, you know, we built a, a server part in the, in the phone process. So we really took advantage of using these you know, low leakage, um, devices that operate at lower power points to, to, to build this product. Um, and we really, we did some extra steps because, you know, there, there is differences obviously between a phone and between a, a, uh, a server. So we did have to work with the fab and make some tweaks to the process, but, but we were able to leverage that dramatically to get a really, really good process for the, a really good manufacturing flow for the, for the Avaton product on the Rangely product. Um, and then the other thing we said, as I mentioned this earlier, is we really worked to to cross-pollinate what we've learned on the client side with what in the, in the mobile side with what we know on the server side and, and really learn lessons from both so that we can make those two and merge them into these Atom-based microservers. And the other thing that, that we get by doing this is we get consistency across product lines, right? So we get, um, you know, we have, you know, now Atom microserver, you know, Xeon microservers, Xeon mainline, and the Intel 5 fam product family offerings. Um, so, so now across, you know, this suite that covers five watts up to, you know, hundreds of watts, you can get consistency. You can get consistent power management interfaces. You can consistent use of turbo. Um, you can get the same architectural interface for PECI. Um, all of the thermal management pieces all, all can be used within the same data center, um, as well as all those power management capabilities we use for, for managing I.O., things like PCIe L1, L2, um, the triple E Ethernet things like that. Um, and we think that's pretty interesting to get that set of consistency from top to bottom across the data center. And, and I think our, our customers think so too. So, so the Atom C2000 family of products um, has a lot of uptake and a lot of design wins at this point. Uh, this slide says 50. I think the number is significantly higher than that at this point. Um, but you can see many of the customers who have designs being designed or already designed in for sale based on Avaton or Rangely. Um, and it's, you can see there are pretty big sets across what we're calling microserver, which is kind of that dense um, scale-out workload like front-end web where I mentioned earlier, across that entry network. So that's things like uh, the security appliance I talked about. And then um, because we have many wins in that section we listed it explicitly is that cold storage thing. So this is um, people designing something like, like say your Facebook profile um, you have thousands of pictures sitting up there. That's really, you know, you don't look at them very often. So we consider that a cold storage tier um, in the data center. And there's a lot of um, value in building those systems around a cheap, dense um, atom microserver because it can, can handle that task really well and it's a lot better fit than putting, you know, some other big Xeon EP or something else on it. Um, and so that's really it. So this is how we're getting Intel inside the data center. We're focusing on creating a, a new family called, uh, based on Atom that extends Intel's portfolio down into this much lower power range, um, as well as scaling up based on the, the Xeon and Mike lines. Uh, Mike is the Intel Phi. Um, and by leveraging Aviton's um, power efficient performance um, to um, target the microservice and storage segments and then rangely in the communication segment. And that's all I have. There's my die. Thank you. I'll bet there are a few questions. Uh, at least one. Trivia Chrome from AMD. <laughs> Likewise. The AMD guy's the first one, huh? No, I'm just um, I was wondering if, if you could go back to the chart that showed uh, 7.13x performance on PHP. I might be able to. 
I think it's towards the end. This one, or you want the next one? Uh, there was another one. Yep. Oh, okay, four seconds. Uh, so is that a two-core versus eight-core comparison, or is that a single-threaded performance? Uh, these are, yeah, this is the, the two-core versus eight-core. So this is the available SOCs on, that were on the market. OK, so, so would it be fair to assume that the single-threaded performance is 1 to 1.85, something like that? Uh, you're, you're looking at it relative to the, the Centerton-based product, or to the? To, to the Centerton-based product. Yeah, so I actually. I skimmed over that back here. Um, but in that general purpose box, you can see the per second rate. Um, there's two bars there. On the left is the, the rate performance, which is when I take as many threads of the benchmark and across, run it across every instance of the cores. Uh -huh. On the right, it says 1.9. That's, 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 that's single thread to single thread. Well, I was kind of more interested in the single thread performance, but on PHP, because that was one of the biggest criticisms on the original item. And the Xeon kind of outperformed that by 3x or 4x. So I was wondering, actually, the gist of my question is, does it bridge the gap between Atom and Xeon on single-threaded performance? I, I think it does, yeah. I, I don't know that number off the top of my head anymore. And, and we don't typically show Atom versus Xeon um, okay. for whatever reason. But yeah, I think it's, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, in my mind, I, like, I think of, of, of the Silvermon architecture as you know, approaching Nehalem performance. It's not there, but it's, you know, it's in spinning distance. So if you think of a single thread on a halum, you, you're probably at 80% of that on a, on a silver mount. OK, thanks. Uh, next over here. Yeah, Mike Filippo from ARM. Um, I'm curious, so you, it's PCIe Gen 2. Why, why not Gen 3? Um, it was really a time to market decision, right? I think we didn't see a whole lot of need for, for Gen 3 devices in the microservice space. There wasn't a lot out there. Um, we didn't think anyone was going to be attaching um, high-end graphics to this. Um, and, and most of the other cards that we, th we looked at when we profiled it what, that would make sense um, you know, was things like you know, LSI cards or, or something like that, most of which were still Gen 2. Um, and it was you know, obviously a simplified design with this. So. You know, we're obviously, as, so, so one of the nice things about getting out to market early um, and getting a bunch of design wins is we have a lot of feedback. So we are doing things to upgrade our I.O. roadmap on the next generation product. But, but that was really the reason. Yeah, Just one didn't one see more quick one. Yep. So you, you described some of the REST uh, capabilities of the memory controllers. Uh, do you have similar types of features in the core? Yeah, so we, we, we're kind of, yeah, it's, all, it's actually all in the I.A. programming manual you can find online, but it's, um, I mean, you, you know, have we, ECC on your RAMs and that sort of thing. We have ECC or parity on all the RAMs. We support the standard machine check architecture that you're familiar with with IA. Um, we have other, you know, we have other RAS characteristics like IO parity to gigabit Ethernet or to PCIe up through all the way up to the core and out to memory, things like that. So it's pretty, definitely added a lot of RAS capability versus other Atom products. Next. Uh, Satoshi Matsushita NEC. I'm currently using, designing an Atom server and you, uh, developing a software on it, and it's high density and quite good one. And I personally think a higher performance is better. But uh, looking at the, the graph at the spec 2006. Yes. It's OK. Um, um, comparing the 1.7 and 2.4G, it consumes uh, the, the clock is 40% higher, but the performance is only 20% bigger, then the power is 60% more. So yeah. uh, how, where do you think it is that the, the sweet, spot, sweet spot is? Oh, um, uh, so free, so it's, a, it's, a, it's a couple things, right? So this is a very specific benchmark case where there's no I.O. going on or anything like that. Um, and that's the, the guaranteed power. It's not necessarily the power being consumed, right? So we may be consuming 12 watts on the on the 8-core 1.7 case, but on the 20-watt the case, we probably have power reserve for I.O. that's not being used in that particular example, so you might be only running at 13 watts. Um, the other thing is we do have turbo, right? So Intel turbo is a lot of the time. Um, given that we don't have a lot of I.O. going on, both of those cores are, you know, are running at, at closer frequencies. I think the 1.7 will turbo up to 1.7, 1.8. 
um, whereas the, the 2.4 is only chirping up to 2.6 or 2.7 gigahertz. Um, so those two things combined, I think, are why you don't see that spread. I think in a more real-world application, it would be a bigger, a bigger difference. Okay, before you guys run off, we have a special announcement. But before we get the announcement, let's uh, thank Brad again. Thank you.